Ah, 2013. The world didn't end up ending. A bit of a shock. The last Pitbull song I've ever heard on the radio came out. The Walter Show finishes. Nelson Mandela dies and some guy at the funeral tricks the whole world into thinking he knew sign language. He didn't. The Harlem Shake's also a thing. Miley Cyrus has now joined a construction company and other stuff. YouTube rewinds are relevant. And the ugliest image of Goku is aired to millions. And after 10 years, he's back. And dubbed. But that's jumping a bit ahead. How did we get here? Well, Toriko and One Piece are no stranger to collabs, but what's Dragon Ball got to do with any of that? Well, Dragon Ball, for its first time in almost two decades, was getting a movie. A story about this villain that looked like a lizard called Beerus, who infects people with evil and was responsible for making the Saiyan race the way they were, until that was entirely scrapped by Toriyama and never spoken of again. There was also J-Star's victory, which was in the works. So from a promotional standpoint, this was certainly a good time to add Monkey Man to this collab, along with a few of his friends. Which on a side note makes me wonder, why is this re-airing now? Is there some Dragon Ball animated thing coming out? Another video game? I certainly hope it isn't another crossover like Jump Force, that was, that was certainly a purchase where I felt I got my money's worth. Anyways, about the special, visually, it looked rough. Very rough. Putting together a two-part episode on a long-running show, yes, this aired as a One Piece episode, definitely took its toll on the staff, and the evidence of that's on screen. But to the breakdown. So this intro, judging of the smoke effects, layouts, and the rotation, I presume is Kenji Yokoyama. He's been tied to One Piece since the show first went on air. For Dragon Ball, he dropped it once. Now, Yokoyama often solo animated his episodes. For those who don't know, for episodes of any show really, many animators are required as animating is a massive job. So considering his skill and speed, he's pretty important and judging off his placement in the credits, he, he did a lot of work. But because of the workload, stuff's pretty basic and even a little rigid at times. I will say animating over 30 people at once must have been a massive pain, so respect there. Probably his best cut though is the entrance of Goku. It's a low tracking shot that eventually comes up and around. Definitely a, a bit of a tricky cut. The constant shift in perspective certainly brings a challenge, say to a flat angle with a single perspective, like the cut before. But although more difficult, it does give a bit more flair to the entrance. Then some more of the cast catches up and hey, Gohan's here. I wonder what he'll do. I will say sliding characters across the background like a PowerPoint transition instead of well, animating them to run faster isn't the most immersive option, but again, time. And we're reminded of its importance as we get the eye catch for the episode, which, yeah, pretty rough. Goku's nose is way off, and some other little errors like broken line and line overlap. Vegeta, I'm not even going to bother. Post edit note, actually, I, I think I will. As I was editing this, I noticed his hair has been partly colored blue, so yeah, I guess just more evidence to the crunch. As well as Toriko's Cheeto looking finger where the bicep line has gone through and been accidentally colored. And by the way, I'm not mentioning this all to say like, haha, stupid animator. But more so just to point out that if the eye catch, the, the, the thumbnail, so to say, of this special is this rough, well, it speaks to how rushed this special was overall. And that's confirmed pretty much right after as we go through the stand. Initially, things are fine. Chief Nibber of Jingle Village appears. <sighs> Toriyama's naming is great. As well as Rising Dragon from that one filler episode in Dragon Ball. Certainly some niche references here. But then we get to Chaozu and Tien. I mean, it's obvious that these drawings were just rushed out. And considering these weren't corrected by any animation director, just shows how busy they were. You've also got this dude's hand, which I don't know what's going on here. That That's munted. As we come up to Dende, ignoring that he's fluoro, one arm has been coloured red. It seems the person colouring was intending to fill in that red bump around his arm with the paint bucket tool, but the line was broken and it coloured the whole thing. The lines are also missing on his arms as well as that outer bump. That mistake was most likely on the animator. And then there is Dende's skin, which is peeling up in the air. Yeah, the, the staff probably developed a, a triple layer of eye bags from all the late nights they had to pull to get this done in time. And it very much is a shame because going off some of the later cuts, whoever it is, can draw some nice poses. 
they're certainly not an amateur. Anyways, outside of the rough art, I need to mention the main guy who's keeping it from getting any worse, and that is the chief animation director, Takio Ide. Now, I feel like I've described the AD position a million times before, but for the sake of new viewers, an animation director or supervisor's job, as it's sometimes referred to, is to check over the key animator's drawings in an effort to keep them on model and just assess them for their overall draftsmanship, which may lead to slight or full redraws, and in some cases there may be alterations outside of that, such as the timing affecting the animation directly. And the chief animation director does the same, but just sits over the regular ADs and can make corrections to their work. It's kind of like the final quality check, and it's typically held by the series character designer. This is why there are two others credited here, Hisashi Kagawa behind the designs for Toriko and Kazuya Hisada for One Piece. Oddly, Tadayoshi Yamamoro Dragon Ball's character designer isn't around. On second thought, that's probably due to him filling that position on Battle of Gods, which, yeah, definitely would have been keeping him busy at this time. Anyways, Ide's corrections can be seen everywhere, which, considering the quality of the art we've seen, his involvement just couldn't be more important. I'm not sure about Hisada and Kagawa, though, maybe because I'm not crazy familiar with Hisada's work post-GT and Kagawa for his short time on Z. Oh, yeah, and Heroes, forgot about that, was always heavily corrected, so yeah, I, a bit clueless there. Eventually, though, we come back to the crew, and I know people make fun of the character designs of this era and say that the nose looks like it has a hole in it, but yeah, this is something else. But yeah, there's, there's not a lot to say about the art and animation of the first part. The Gohan and Sanji crew come across an oversized ape that eats Google JPEGs. Roshi and Skull Dude do what they, you know, they do their thing. Trunks and Goten fuse, King Kai enters, and Vegeta appears. With a very short battle before like disappearing until right near the end of the episode, it's kind of funny when you realize that Mr. Satan plays a bigger role than him in this special. But yeah, the animation is just standard TV anime stuff. Ide is working overtime trying to bring some polish to the art and puts out some really nice drawings I'll add. I know this might not be the most loved era of his work among the Dragon Ball fandom, but yeah, this is solid work. It is a little surprising that for entrances like Gotenks and Vegeta, the drawings are this unpolished. Like for Goku's appearance, Ide's corrections come in strong and ironically for Gotenks' second appearance, same again. Although the first two times for the two, yeah, I, I don't know what happened. Guess we'll never know. But after the goofy hijinks, it's time to give the people what they want. A fight between Luffy and Goku. And Toriko. And Mr. Satan. Yeah, somehow he found himself in the ring. And suddenly realises he might die. His lies and deception all these years have run their course. It is time for him to depart from this little blue planet and sit as a mere memory in the minds of his family and friends. Just kidding, it's a commercial break. Great placement. So when we come back, we are greeted with a very nice drawing of Goku. Overall, the art is a lot more polished in this section and considering it's the main draw of the first part, it very much makes sense why. Even the crowd shots have Ide's touch. The storyboard also has some nice angles. Then it begins. Dragon Ball's old action ace and a One Piece regular being there literally from the series first episode steps up and his skill in conveying impact is still there for the hits, but the movement is definitely a bit rigid and there being little to no anticipation doesn't help. If you're confused at all what I mean, um, anticipation very simply is the preparation before an action. Like in this cut by Yutaka Nakamura of Dandy, he launches back, then releases. In a much older Shimanuki scene, although a little stiffer, you can see Goku drawing his arm back and then again the release. Here there's no wind up, it just snaps between two drawings. But at least the characters are well drawn, even if you can see traces of One Piece's art style coming through, which isn't all too surprising, since it had been like, what, 14 years he had been working on the show? It's certainly a world away from that Dragon Ball Saga intro he animated close to a decade earlier, but the One Piece shapes are definitely still around in the face and mouth. When pulling up his later work in Super, for example, you can pretty clearly see the difference. Then it's Gear 2 time. Someone else steps in, don't know who, it's fine though. Nice angle and a bit of background animation as Luffy launches forward. Goku has to join in of course though, and takes them both on. And we get a great example of the value of good in-betweeners as Goku's face suddenly morphs and melts. Now I'll mention, animation is meant to be seen in motion. 
taking one bad in between and going, hey, look at this bad animation is not the greatest way to assess it. It's not really an assessment of animation at all. I mean, in the Shimanuki cut from before, you can see a rough in-between drawing. But in this case, the lack of quality in-betweens is to the point where it is noticeable in motion and affects the animation. But that was really just the tip of the iceberg. As the crew powers up, first Toriko, then Luffy, things are looking good, and then Goku. Now trust me when I say we've had some great contenders when it comes to bad Goku drawings, but this definitely shoots up the charts. And I, yeah, I, I don't know what happened. This is certainly a correction by Ide, and as we've seen, he can draw Dragon Ball. That ain't an issue. And it seems the animator he was correcting was now Toshishida, who also is an excellent artist and animator. I mean, some of the top art and animation for this special comes from his hand. But yeah, it seems Ide's style doesn't mesh too well with Shida's. I'm also unsure if Ide adjusted his timing because with the Kamehameha or Kamehameha, whatever way you like to say it, the art's clearly Shida, the camera work as well, but just isn't timed out like his regular stuff. Maybe Shida did second key A? He did do a lot of work on this special, so I mean, it does make sense also for some of his work just to be a bit rougher than usual. Although the effects at the end definitely feel like his standard output, which of course look great by the way. Anyhow, to avoid the Toei officers being stormed by whichever fan base's MC lost, every character is conveniently knocked out of bounds. Even Goku. And Mr. Satan takes the win. However, to avoid committing the sin of gluttony, he shares his food with the unemployed. And all is well. Oh wait, Goku's here to tell the children to keep the television on. So after an almost three minute recap, even though this aired as one episode special thing, uh, we're back. Everyone digs in, Boo also makes an appearance, but visually, it's fine, mostly. Cool scene. Then we find out the true purpose of the tournament, with some quick palette swaps by the director when it's revealed, which is cool, although the colors shift, the values don't, and it kind of looks like the dude turned into a lobster. Or maybe it's just the skin highlights that give that feel. And then out of nowhere, some little floating fish appears. But this is the Goku, Luffy, and Toriko episode, so Gohan is instantly disposed of. And I know this isn't a review on the writing, but they could have at least let him get a hidden or something. So yeah, the fish absorbs their power, and in the Japanese version, we get some distorted cougar sound effect. Like, I swear, one of these dudes at Suara Productions was, like, ripping YouTube audio. Like, listen to this thing side by side. Moving on, Sanji's group finds the cougar fish, and it is limited overall, but there is some nice stuff sandwiched in. The cut of Sanji had a solid rotation and good impact, which is more engaging visually, say to something like this. Interesting effects work as well, some sharp expressive art also. Wish I knew who it was, I feel like I, I should. Then the next group engages the creature. There's again not too much animation to speak of, mostly stills with camera shake and some good effects work sprinkled in. The drawings are fine, yeah. But then at long last, we get something that's actually dense animation wise as Toriko, Goku and Luffy finally come face to face with the fish. And not surprisingly, it's now Toshishida who handles a lot of this fight. I've probably said it before, but Shida's focus is on constant motion with complex camera work at a high frame rate with expressive art. It's very difficult, time consuming, but looks great. And after the very limited and basic animation we've mostly had so far, it's something this episode needs and deserves. Anyway, the monster's defeated and it's time to celebrate, but after the commercial break. Oh wait, never mind. Back to work, Shida. The fish returned. So before Shida returns, Ide does some key animation. The line work and shading is definitely him. No different actually than his old work in that respect. Really cool dynamic poses as well. The next three cuts after though, I'm not as sure. Some minor traits that remind me of him, but I hope it isn't because yeah, that cut's not too hot. However, this cut here, despite the insane ghosting, which makes it slightly more difficult to see what's going on, he's credited very low on the list, so it adds up that this is all he did. Anyhow, Goku has resorted to the spirit bomb, or Genki Dama. Shida steps back in and shows his talent doesn't just reside in action as he puts out a pretty nice board. Oh yeah, probably should mention he boarded some of this special. The shot of Goku gathering energy is my particular favorite. The low angle gives a heroic feel. Then the size contrast between this massive energy ball and this very small character that's holding it further, I think, plays into that. And then finally, the framing of the environment circling around 
well, for one, draws the viewer to the focal point, very clear in that area, but also gives a grandiose feel to this moment. Then after, Shida gives one of the most animated takes I've ever seen involving the spirit bomb. And then Luffy and Toriko join. Shida's art is just at its most expressive here. Completely ditches the model sheets as always. But yeah, easily some of the strongest drawings in this episode. Goku then goes all out and powers up to Super Saiyan 3. <sighs> Simpler times. And his take on the form is beautiful. It's been a hot minute since he's also last animated Goku in that form. And what's better is we also got a photocopy of his Gengar that he posted years back. Although it's a photocopy because the original apparently ended up in the trash can along with a lot of other drawings and quote, without hesitation. Ah, if only Shida knew how insane the Dragon Ball Gengar market would become. But yeah, well animated finale, nice way to finish. The rest of the episode though is mostly just some nice stills and some, yeah, great background art. The final bit of animation though is just reused stuff from the first part, which reminds us once again just how strapped for time this special really was. Overall, considering this was a crossover, it visually could have been a lot more in terms of artwork, animation, and direction. I mean, you had a showdown between two of Shonen's most popular characters who also have some very unique moves. The fight choreography just could have been so much more. I guess though, there is a reason many people forget this fight ever happened, and many didn't even know this special existed until it's re-release this year. But hey, if you enjoyed it, that's cool, totally fine. Outside of the main departments I've talked about, it was a fun little watch. Anyways, with that though, thank you for watching, uh, give like and check out our sponsor Fandom Eon which has some uh, merch from a million and one shows and you can use the discount code RELICS for a 10% discount. Also the link to the store will be in the description and in a pinned comment. And finally, shout out to Sol Binku in the High Roller class and to all my patrons. And with that, I'll see you later.